Hey everyone, this is the third segment of the environment chapter in historical geology. Um, I stopped at the limiting factors and I was talking about the, the first two, the temperature and the salinity. And I just finished the, the distribution of the salinity versus the latitude depend on the climate, rain and the precipitation. The next um, limiting factor is the energy level. Um, if you think about it, uh, the shoreline is much uh, higher energy environment because you've got the waves and the tides. Um, and only certain type of plants and animals can live in this uh, environment. So now after all this, we're going to talk about the different sedimentary environments. This is going to be really, really important. Um, this, a sedimentary environment is the area of, an, of the earth uh, surface where sediment might, might deposit. Um, we can distinguish them from other areas on the basis of, of physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. And before we study ancient sedimentary environments, it is helpful to study the present day sedimentary environments today. So here is the list. Uh, first, we're gonna start with the continental environments, which is always above the sea level. We have to talk about the soil environments. It's important to realize paleo soils, and I'm gonna talk about in just one minute, the lake environment is called also lacustrine. You have the glacial environment, fluvial, which is all the stream. So if I ask you, please tell me about the depositional environment, then these are the ones you will have to tell me. The, the soil, the lacustrine, the glacial, the fluvial. Then you've got the, the fluvial includes all the stuff like the alluvial fan, braided streams, uh, meandering streams and delta. But of course the delta belongs to the transitional environment now. So the transitional environment is the delta beach and the swamps. And then you got the marine sedimentary environment which is always below the sea level. And this is where we will learn about the continental shelf and the, the organic reef, continental slope and rise and the pelagic or the very deep uh, water environment. And this slide just shows you the, the same environment in a, on, a, on a drawing. So you can see all this. So let's start with the continental environment. And we're going to start with the, the first type of continental environment, which is the most common, is the soil environment. And I mean, you've seen a bunch of soil environment, but this... Uh, this picture shows you a couple of so-called paleo soil environment. Paleo soil environment, which is not exposed today, but it has been on the surface before and soil was forming on it. Sometimes it's quite hard to tell apart the soil environment from other. And I know because when I was in grad school, one of my colleagues was working on Cambrian rocks. And it, during the Cambrian, there were no plants on land because if you do have plants, like I was working in Triassic and in the Triassic plants were abundant, so therefore the soil environment was easily rec recognizable because I had the roots and, and the burrows and everything. But when there was no animals, it was pretty hard or plants actually. Uh, so so uh, soils from the Carboniferous, um, probably even the Devonian, was pretty, uh, before it was really hard to recognize, but after it is very easy because we have all the, the roots, animal bur burrows, as I already said. So these are very important diagnostic features. So altogether, it's very important to realize if you have a palo soil um, layer because that proves that that area has been exposed to, to, to oxygen and the, um, and the surface. Many times it's very, very important. This slide shows you two uh, different time in the geologic time. 
that uh, it's very easily recognizable that these areas are palo soil areas, but I mean palo soil environments. The next one is the lake. The lakes as depositional environment uh, are not very, very common in the sedimentary record, but, but they are very important to realize. And um, we, we most of the time can separate lake environment with, uh, because of the lakes usually have very, very low diversity versus the ocean. The ocean always have much higher diversity than the lakes. So that's what we can use. Like if you think of Smith Mountain Lake, I mean, how many type of animals and, and, and uh, plants are in there? You have like three, four kind of fish, one type of snail with no ornamentation. So it's really, really very low diversity. Just think about the coral reef, like the Nemo environment. Um, hundreds of fish, hundreds of, of corals, plants, sea anemone, whatever you want. So you see the lake environment usually is very easy to separate because of the low diversity of the fossils. So now the next one is the glacial environment, which is extremely important because if you want to talk anything about previous ice ages, it's almost, yeah, it is very, very important. So uh, one of the main characteristics, if you are still able to see the, the valleys and the mountains, is that when you have glacial environment, the 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 ice is going to make typical U-shaped valleys. And the sediment is very characteristic too. Very characteristic too. So here you can see the, the U-shaped valleys. Just like on this figure, it, it still has some ice in it. See how u shape it versus the water uh, valleys are V-shaped. So V-shape is the river and the U-shape is the glacial. And the sediment which forms in a glacier environment is this very, very um, immature, uh, unsorted, and very polymicked. Polymicked means it has every kind of rocks which the surrounding has. So if it comes from a granite mountain, so you got a lot of different kinds. What Wherever the glacier went through, all the rocks will be uh, represented in the in the glacier teal. We call it teal light. So just remember, teal light is a typical glacier deposit. Very unsorted, very mature, um, very polymicked, which means every kind of rocks the glacier went through will be represented in the, in this uh, rock type, the teal light. Now the other important glacial uh, depositional environment is the glacial lake. Anytime the glacier finishes, it always finishes in a lake, right here. And in the lake, you will have the lake sediment. Uh, during the winter, when the glacier is all frozen, there is hardly any sedimentation. There is some algae in the lake and that is the dark layer, it's undecayed organics. During the summer, some little sediment will come in from the glacier, so the summer deposits are usually thicker, or the winter deposits is very thin. And depending on what kind of summer did we have, if we had like a long, warm summer, then it's more sediment. If we had just a short summer, like this one right here, that means it was, um, not much sediment coming in. So this is like the three rings. It's an extremely uh, good thing to study the lake sediments because you can tell the length and the, the warmth of the summers and, and the coldness of the winters. So it will tell you about paleoclimate. It's very important. This is actually actual lake sediments. 
and actually they correlated them like from three different places it's really cool because you can really do that and you can tell them that was like a long cut summer um, and this one was a short summer so you can kind of tell what has happened okay the next environment is the desert and arid basins and whenever you are in the desert there is no soil formation so no chemical but only physical weathering uh, you will have carbonate precipitating and evaporates remember gypsum and hydride halite and sylvite sometimes and around the mountains you're gonna have aluminum alu aluminum alluvial fans right here as they come down to the more flat areas you're gonna have the alluvial fans uh, now in these environments, especially around the alluvial fans, we got um, unsorted polymicked bracteal conglomerate, very similar to the glacial environment, but it's not as polymicked as the glacial environment. And very many times it's it's surrounded by by salty gypsy deposits of the of the basin right here. So the alluvial fan will have relatively similar uh, type of sediment as in the in the glacial sediments. Another thing which is very characteristic for the desert that because of the wind, very many times the the pebbles around the the bottom of the desert, like exactly this area. They'll have manganese cover on them from uh, from just the the wet seasons. Uh, usually, if you have mud cracks, that just means that there are alternating wet and dry uh, area. The Death Valley is one of uh, a very very good example. This area, the basin kind of area, is is. Uh, full of water in the springtime but then it dries up and it makes a big salt surface during the summer. In this area you also have a bunch of sand dunes uh, and usually it is carried by the wind therefore uh, in the sand dunes the sediment is well sorted, the grains are very well rounded and almost all the time it's very mature mostly containing quartz uh, if the prevailing wind direction is changing somewhat, uh, the cross beds are going to be very, very characteristic. They, they are called uh, trough cross stratification. Each layer is a little bit different thickness and the angles of the low forceps are different from layer to layer also because of the, the change of the trade wind direction. This is a typical picture from Zion National Park, and that's the sand in Death Valley. If the climate is changing and it would become more humid, then the sand dune would become stable and actually plants would start growing on it. Okay, now we are at the fluvial or river system. And you will have to talk about the alluvial fan, the braided stream, meandering stream, and the delta. And remember, the delta belongs also to the transitional environment. So let's start with the alluvial fan. We already mentioned it in the desert, but um, as part of the, the fluvial system, we again have to talk about it. As you can see here, when, when you have an alluvial fan that means that the stream is coming from the mountain mostly in desert areas so when when it rains it's really really heavy rain so the water is coming really really fast it brings a lot of sediment and as soon as as it reaches the more flat area it actually puts down all the sediment because it loses the energy speed goes down so it will actually make this uh, fan shape Form and all the sediment is piled down right here just like on this picture so what kind of sediment we're gonna have it's gonna be very poorly sorted uh, bracture conglomerate 
and it's very very polymic means that you have a lot of different kind of uh, fragments whatever was up in the mountain so that's the alluvial fan this is a typical alluvial fan deposit you can see it's very very poorly sorted uh, relatively polymate uh, the shape of the grains are very angular they didn't go far away at all the next slide shows the reverse system uh, uh, the second part of the reverse system which is the braided stream the braided stream is relatively um, more flat just below the alluvial fan uh, it will have very complex network of channels or we call them rivulets with a lot of sediment bars as you can see right here um, the bars between the channels are usually very coarse grained hardly rounded po poorly sorted sediment mostly conglomerate uh, and in the channel the sediment usually is going to be cross buried um, so the typical end product is polymic conglomerate and cross, very, very coarse grain sand, possibly in the channel. Uh, in lab, what you will have to do, you will have to be able to tell, if you look at a rock samples, you will have to tell me what kind of environment it formed in. So that's why we're going through all this. So this is a typical braided stream deposit. And the next one, but I guess I'm going to stop right here. Uh, it will be the meandering stream, but it's going to be in the next segment. Bye now.